Delhi, India's capital city. 18 million people and growing fast. Over the last 15 years, towns and cities across much of South Asia have exploded in size, placing huge demands on the natural environment. But as fast as the urban jungle is expanding, something vital is disappearing from the landscape. 10 or 15 years ago, there were over 40 million vultures in India alone. And now we're down to just a few thousand, and those are declining at up to 40% per year. So the, the declines are just unprecedented. Numbers have crashed so rapidly that three species, the oriental white-backed, long-billed and slender-billed vulture, now face extinction in only a few years. Vultures are highly efficient scavengers. They're a vital link in the food chain. A free social service to millions of people, recycling nature's waste and helping prevent the spread of disease. But today, there are virtually no vultures left in the wild to clean up the mess. Dr. Vibhu Prakash from the Bombay Natural History Society has been monitoring raptor populations in Bharatpur in northern India for over 20 years. But on one crucial research trip during the 1990s, he noticed something alarming. We saw dead birds hanging from the trees, on the nest, and almost everywhere. So my first thought was, it must be a poisoning. And then we started investigating. Hoping to avert an ecological disaster, Financial support came quickly from the UK government's Darwin Initiative and the RSPB. More help came from ZSL and the Haryana state government, allowing the Bombay Natural History Society to set up a vulture care centre 300 miles north of Delhi on the outskirts of Pinjore. The main purpose of the centre was to find out the cause of mortality in vultures. You know, we were getting a lot of sick birds all over the country and we didn't have a place to keep them. It wasn't until 2003 that scientists working for the Peregrine Fund in Pakistan discovered that a livestock drug called diclofenac was causing kidney failure in vultures. Diclofenac was introduced as a veterinary drug across the Indian subcontinent in the early 1990s, so it was one of the major suspects. Once they established that the diclofenac was a problem, or was killing vultures in Pakistan, we also tested our tissue samples in India, vultures which we have stored in this centre. And we found that all the vultures which had died of uh, visceral gout also had uh, diclofenac in tissues. For a vulture that feeds on a, a cattle carcass which has got diclofenac in it, it will often live for one or two days, but it may be quite a long way from where it's fed and that's one of the reasons it took a long while to establish what the problem was because you don't get a dead vulture nearby to a, um, a, a diclofenac laced carcass. Now there was a cause but still no cure. To save at least some of the vultures before they became extinct, Dr Prakash and his team immediately started to gather as many healthy vulture chicks as possible from the wild placing them in the safe and diclofenac-free environment of the care centre at Pinjor, hoping one day it will be possible to breed from them. Most of the birds that we have in the centres were actually brought in as nestlings from the wild, and that's the ideal scenario. But we do want and need some birds that brought in as older birds as well to uh, have a good age structure of the, of the birds and, and get the breeding growing uh, sooner rather than later. Soon afterwards, three more centres were set up in Assam, West Bengal and Nepal, along with a WWF captive breeding centre in Pakistan. By 2008, the first oriental white-backed chicks successfully hatched and fledged in the aviaries at Pinjore. And the following year, the first ever captive-bred slender-billed vulture chick was born and fledged, suggesting that a vulture breeding program could be the key to their long-term survival in the wild. 
but Dr. Prakash realized it would take too long to build up a vulture breeding population this way. He hoped that removing the first clutch of eggs for hand rearing may encourage the adult vultures to relay, helping to boost numbers. In 2010, for the first time, the eggs of three long-billed and two oriental white-backed vultures were taken from aviary nests. But would they successfully hatch in the incubators and could they keep the chicks alive? You get very nervous because you're not sure what's going to happen and uh, you don't feel good taking away the egg. Our most exciting moment was when we kept the egg on a flat surface and it started twitching. But then suddenly in the morning, around 11 o'clock, the egg pipped and it cracked and out came a baby. It was messy. There was a little, you know, it had a fecal sac. We got really frightened because the bird was not calling. And then the baby yawned and it looked fine. Oh, it was such a uh, satisfying moment that, yes, we, we could do it and the egg hatched. But once the birds are hatched, they need feeding, and it's expensive. Running the breeding program here in India costs over £200,000 a year, but half of that cost is actually the goat meat that we need to feed the vultures. And we need to use goats because partly for religious reasons it's uh, not acceptable to slaughter cattle, but also we can keep them for a few days quite easily and we can ensure that they don't have any diclofenac injection in that time and even if they had had it beforehand it goes through their system more quickly. So goat meat is the best food for the vultures and the most practical. Outside the safety of the breeding centre however, diclofenac still poses a deadly threat. In 2006, after intensive scientific testing, an alternative drug called meloxicam was found to be just as effective in treating livestock, but crucially it was safe for vultures. At last, there was a credible solution. The Indian government actually banned diclofenac back in 2006 or issued a directive to stop the manufacture of veterinary formulations. And that was a huge breakthrough. The research done on meloxicam and safety testing was a crucial part of getting the, the governments to uh, feel confident to, to take that step and that was then followed in Nepal and in Pakistan. And recently, diclofenac has been banned in Bangladesh as well. But despite changes in the law, the high cost of meloxicam meant that many vets illegally offered the cheaper human form of diclofenac to farmers instead, which is still widely available on the high street. So, even with the good news about meloxicam, the prospects for India's vultures were bleak. With several species of vultures across South Asia now facing extinction due to the widespread use of the veterinary drug diclofenac, in 2009 help came unexpectedly. 4,000 miles away in Germany, Beringer Ingelheim, the original developers of meloxicam, suddenly released the patent on its manufacturing formulation, making it easy and cheap for others to produce the vulture-safe veterinary drug. But what prompted such a landmark gesture? After understanding the cause of the problem, and namely that a compound that is in widespread use, diclofenac, has these toxic side effects, and at the same time learning that a Burring Ingelheim molecule, meloxicam, is safe in vultures, we learned that um, we could um, get involved and help with our knowledge. In this particular situation, we had to weigh how much could it help to release the patent versus our economic downside. And um, clearly, that was um, the benefits versus the downsides were so clear that um, we decided to um, give up our formulation patent in India. One very positive thing is that there are now more than 20 manufacturers of meloxicam right across the subcontinent, and so it's becoming more widely available, and with that and the competition, the price is coming down and, and is 
coming down much closer to the price of diclofenac, but up to now it's been more expensive. Before any vultures can be released back into the wild, the amount of diclofenac still present in the food chain must be monitored and reduced. So vets from the breeding center at Pinjor take liver samples from dead livestock at carcass dumps. Although the use of meloxicam is increasing, today the levels of diclofenac are still much too high for vultures to survive. Across the border in Nepal, they're trying to protect the small remaining populations of wild vultures by creating safe zones in areas surrounding vulture breeding colonies. Here, they're acquiring and destroying all available diclofenac stocks and replacing them with meloxicam. The vulture safe zones initially started in 2006 in a place called Pitoli and along the buffer zone of Chito National Park. It started out as a safe feeding site, what we call vulture restaurant, or we popularly uh, have named them as Jatai restaurants. Old or sick cattle are collected from local farmers and cared for in enclosures to ensure they're free from any traces of diclofenac. When the time comes, the carcass is taken to the feeding area, or Jatayu restaurant, for the vultures to enjoy a safe, diclofenac-free meal. But these birds can travel hundreds of kilometers in search of food. So what happens when they feed outside of the existing protected areas or fly into neighboring countries? So it is very important to address the transboundary issue of vulture conservation. That means we need support, cooperation, and strong and reliable communication with our neighbors' countries like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, where vultures are critically endangered. To ensure that diclofenac is removed from the environment effectively, it's vital that everyone across the subcontinent, from farmers, conservation groups, local communities and governments, work together and join the cause to save Asia's vultures from extinction. Education plays a major role. At the breeding center in Pinjor, student wardens from the Wildlife Institute of India learn about vultures in the wild and how to protect them. Once qualified, they'll be able to spread the word about vulture conservation throughout South Asia. And getting the message through to children is just as important. Elders in the um, village are, have seen vultures and they are aware of their role in ecology. Uh, in our environment, but youngsters and the children may not have seen vultures and they are not aware of uh, how good efficient scavengers and uh, efficient workers vultures were. The school children find it all very fascinating when I show them vultures uh, in the presentation. I make sure that they understand the, that diclofenac is the cause and that they should go home and tell their parents not to give diclofenac to their cattle and use meloxicam. So that's what I drum into them, drill into them, and that's what message they give at home. These children will grow up and become the future. They may become a forest officer or a scientist. So by educating them, we can uh, make sure that uh, vultures will definitely survive. Meloxicam, diclofenac. But despite a decade of tireless work, the future for vultures in the subcontinent still hangs in the balance. The key lies in convincing everyone to stop using diclofenac and start using meloxicam instead. And if this simple message is taken on board, the hope is that one day vultures will once again fly freely across the skies of South Asia. The really big challenge is getting diclofenac completely out of the environment so we can release birds back to the wild and hopefully we can keep some of those existing populations still going before they go to full extinction. When we started out we didn't know for sure that we'd be able to breed these species in captivity. The fact that we've now bred all three species successfully is a tremendous uh, boost for us and gives us confidence that we're going to be able to produce 
uh, these species in sufficient numbers to actually reintroduce them, which is what this is about, of course. There's still lots and lots to do. And, uh, but we are heading in a uh, positive direction with all the successful hatchings at our center and making people aware of the harmful effect of diclofenac. I'm sure we will see vultures in the sky sometimes during the future. I'm very positive about that.